All right, good. So good morning. This is our Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So this is our Friday. And uh, everybody said earlier they're ready for spring break. Me too. So last time we talked about the um, chemical evidence of the drug trade, the chemical side of things. Uh, this middle section of the course is on chemical evidence, things that you'll get in the lab that are, that are trace chemicals that you'll analyze with the instrumental methods and so on. And then the last third of the class is physical evidence. So it's kind of hard to maybe artificial to separate the two because you'll get both, but, but it's just uh, at least for organizing things. In this middle course, we're talking about the chemistry and the actual substances that you'll analyze, whereas um, uh, later on, it'll be, it'll be more physical objects. You won't be analyzing them chemically. Things like, um, uh, you know, bullet casings and things like that. You know, you're not really doing, you may do some chemical tests on those, but mostly those are visual or pattern evidence. <clears throat> so this one uh, is going to be talking about the chemistry of combustion, arson, explosives, and nuclear weapons. So all of the chemical evidence related to all of those different things. So that's a huge topic, <laughs> but we'll, you'll see some uh, recurring themes. Now, combustion evidence is the second most common forensic evidence behind drugs and toxicology. So it is important. You see a lot of it. And, and so we'll talk about combustion basics, uh, what goes into having a fire, and then that transfer from combustion <clears throat> to what we call deflagration. And then if you have a, a you know, a, a well mixed oxygen source, it could go into detonation. So there's a difference between burning and exploding. So we'll talk about that. So what is explosive detonation? We'll get into a little bit of the physics behind that. And then we'll, since I have some experience in uh, the nuclear weapons complex, I'll talk about what makes a nuclear explosive because um, we live in a, in a nuclear age and if you get evidence related to, uh, say, nuclear terrorism, what would you look for chemically? What, what are some of the signatures? So, so let's talk, let's just start with combustion in general. You hear about the fire triangle where you have to have heat, fuel, and oxidation. So you need an oxidant, you need fuel, and you need heat. Uh, the heat is that activation energy. So we have, I mean, basically, we're somewhat combustible. Our clothing certainly is combustible, okay? And we're surrounded by 20% oxygen. So we have fuel and we have oxygen, but that activation energy we don't have, hopefully, <laughs> right? And so we need that heat to get it started. Once you start the decomposition of complex fuel molecules into smaller fuel molecules, then they can start reacting with oxygen. And then that generates more heat, which keeps the system going. So it's really the decomposition of the larger fuel molecules into smaller, um, more readily flammable molecules that gets the fire started. Um, <clears throat> even then though, this uh, will go slowly or not at all if the fuel and the oxygen are not mixed. And so that's, you have the, the fire triangle, but really mixing and intimate, intimate contact is, is necessary. And so that's how we fight the fires is uh, a lot of times we will spray water mist. That's the least expensive. Uh, we have sprinkler systems in here. That's what those little circles are in some of the ceiling tiles. So we have four sprinklers in here. That little thing right there is a little light sensor or motion sensor. So the lights will go off if nobody's in the room. But if, if you come in, then it'll turn the lights on. Obviously that's our Wi-Fi and our, we've got speakers in here now. So we've got quite a lot going on in our ceiling. But the, the water mist would be our firefighting. And that's a physical effect. It's removing the heat. Uh, CO2 powders, it removes the oxidant. So it pushes it away. And it um, also interferes with the combustion reaction. Okay. And then foam also separates the oxygen from the fuel. And so you can create a foam barrier around the fuel. Um, that's really helpful for... Uh, for liquid fuels, like if you go to um, or look on on the online about uh, firefighting at airports, you have a you know a leak from an airplane. You got jet fuel; it catches fire. They come with the foam trucks and they blow foam on there. Um, so, and then halogen. This is uh, also attacking the heat. It's a chemical effect. So you could throw like a halogenated organic solvent on the fire, and that sounds crazy, but that would work because the, the uh, carbon-halogen bonds, 
chlorine is typical, but even fluorine is now being used in solvents where I work um, in cleaning, that they'll put a lot of fluorinated compounds in there and knock the flammability of a, of a solvent blend back to where it's um, safe to use. And so this was a fire grenade that I saw at Texas Tech. They had a, a pharmacy school and they built this um, sort of historically accurate pharmacy. And in the corner it said fire extinguisher and it had this uh, glass bulb of carbon tetrachloride with a, with a dye in it. And it said, throw it base of fire. <laughs> so you throw this carbon tetrachloride in there and then run because it's going to make phosgene or, or not phosgene, but uh, some, you know, chlorinated, it's certainly going to make HCl, um, but it's going to steal the heat from that fire. Okay. It's going to also be very toxic. So it's old school. Now just to, um, let's see, I haven't, I don't know that I've tried this link. Let's try it. Tried all the other links in the class. Okay, so this is uh, talking about a backdraft. Let me just show you. Um, let's get ahead. Okay, stop there. Yeah, you see the movie backdraft? You know what I'm talking about? It's an old show. So you saw that, that smoke get pushed out uh, from under the door and then get sucked back in. If this room were to catch fire, and we don't have a lot of combustible loading in here, but if you like, come to my office and you see all of those books, I've got way more fuel in that room than the oxygen in the room can can burn. And so that fire would generate a lot of heat, decompose the paper in my books, and then we would have a, a really flammable mix of fuel in the air, but the oxygen's well depleted. And so if the door's closed, that fire will slow down, but the heat's not gone. And so we already have the, uh, the, the two of the three of the fire triangle. We have the fuel, we have the heat, it's well mixed, and all we need is oxygen. And so if you were to crack that door, it would suck air in, it'd be a huge vacuum. And that oxygen would move in, mix, and you got the heat, you got the fuel, now you have the oxygen and it would explode out. And so that's what they call a backdraft explosion. Don't open the door. So that's a pretty accurate picture of it you see let's see I think I have some actual ones yeah that was a real one did you see that he busted the window and a fire shot out so see look at that Whoosh. so the oxygen rushed in and then caught all of that hot gas on fire and it blew out Okay, pretty active music, yes. So let's talk about this combustion continuum. We have all kinds of, uh, of factors here on the left. We have the fuel and, and when we have large hydrocarbons, they need to be decomposed first. And so you'll have a pretty slow fire if you have uh, you know, intact organic molecules. You know, carbon has four bonds and everything like that. But if those start to break down, then you have more reactive species. And so the smaller the, the hydrocarbon, the faster it's going to burn if it's well mixed with oxygen. So over here on the left side, we have subsonic burning. And this is the real key here is the speed of sound and the, uh, the, the burning compared to the speed of sound. So in the middle, if we take the... Um, oxygen containing molecules like nitrates and sulfates and we mix those in with uh, with carbon containing fuel press that into pellets now you have the oxygen mixed in with the fuel all you need is the activation energy so if you give that that mixture an activation energy then it can burn inside the powder and so that's again for firearms that would be a propellant and so we're, we're controlling the speed of the burn by the pellet size and the mixture of the oxygenated compounds and so on. Then if we go into explosives and we actually put nitro groups and nitrate groups inside the molecule, now it doesn't get any better mixed. You've got a benzene ring with nitro groups on it, like tri-nitrotoluene. And there, the molecules, every molecule has enough oxygen for it to burn substantially. 
And so that can be really fast. And you have low and high explosives. It just depends on how much energy they produce and their oxygen balance. And so a low explosive has uh, potentially a lower oxygen balance and it burns at a slower rate and it has uh, um, produces less energy or a high explosive, which would produce more energy. But both of the explosives have a supersonic uh, shock wave speed of, speed of sound. So that's, that's the real key here is this, um, you could have burning, that burning could speed up. If you have oxygen inside the mix, it could go to deflagration. So that's what this word here is. It's a burning where the, the uh, shock wave or the burn rate is close to the speed of sound. And then, of course, explosive and detonation is faster or supersonic. It's faster than the speed of sound. Now, one way to control the, the burn rate is to control the confinement. And so, our, you know, you say, well, wait, I, th I think I thought you could use gunpowder as an explosive. Well, you can if you confine it. If you have it burn inside a, a, a container and then that container ruptures, then you could use it as an explosive. Um, but if you have it partially contained, then it'll burn at a predictable rate. And if you think about our firearms, it's the burn of the powder that gives us our predictability. So if you've sighted your rifle in at 100 yards, that bullet is taking a, a ballistic path, a parabolic path. and and. Your, your vertical accuracy is going to be completely based upon the powder that you have in that cartridge and how consistently it burns. Because if it burns really fast in one example, then it's going to, it's going to give you a different vertical fall rate than, you know, on a faster muzzle velocity than if it burns slowly and has a lot of unburned powder coming out the end of the rifle. If you completely confine, confine it, then you can have... Uh, you have a detonation. So, so these are some of the factors in turning a flame into deflagration, which is burning at near the speed of sound into a detonation. So DDT, that's deflagration to detonation transition. And in terms of safety, that's a really bad thing. In terms of like demolition explosives, that's a really good thing. You, you want to control it. Okay. So the real thing that we'll focus on is what is the speed of the burn? Is it subsonic? Then it's, then it's uh, burning. If it's close to the speed of sound, it's deflagration. And if it's supersonic, then it's, it's an explosion. And so that's related to... Um, now, it's kind of strange if you think about this... When we talk about the speed of sound, we're talking about the speed of sound in the substance, and it's a solid, so the speed of sound is very fast. So how can the reaction go through the material faster than the ability of the molecules to actually hit each other? Because that's what the speed of sound is. Think about it. You know, sound waves travel through a medium by this molecule colliding into that molecule and colliding into that molecule. So it's conceptually difficult to think about how the reaction could go through the material faster than the actual communication of the atoms and molecules, which would be the speed of sound. But it does. Essentially, the, the, an energy wave gets built up in an explosive and travels through the material. Part of it has to do with radiation. So the speed of light is much faster than the speed of sound. So this energy travels through the, through the material. And essentially, if it's an explosive, it breaks all of the bonds. So think about all the covalent bonds holding the nitro groups to the aromatics. If you come through and you break all of those bonds, now there's no penalty for the oxygen saying, you know, I'm hooked to a nitrogen, but I'd rather be hooked to water or two hydrogens to make water. Or this oxygen says, I'd rather be hooked to this carbon and make CO2. So in the, the small space of a solid, all of a sudden you have gaseous water and gaseous CO2. And if you have extra nitrogen, you make, might make some nitric oxide or something like that. Or you might have the nitrogens get together and say, hey, we'd like to have triple bonds here. And so the nitrogens get together and make nitrogen. 
So in the density of the solid, you now have really, really hot gases, super compression. And so then they expand because they're hot and, and stable. And so this energy shockwave goes through the material, creates more stable species, essentially gaseous species, and then you have enormous pressures and that's what causes the explosive to spread out and push things over. Okay. So in terms of combustion of wood, it's a, it's a um, carbohydrate. So it's CH2 is its generic formula for all carbohydrates. You can react that with oxygen, make CO2 and water. Uh, but what do you see when you see a flame? You see the blue flame, which are the redox reactions. A lot of times the blue is coming from the hydroxyl radical. So oxygen grabs hold of one hydrogen and, and starts to relax electronically and gives off blue light. And then you see the orange and yellow color, that's um, unreacted carbon. So if you have impart or if you have partial burning, um, uh, you know, kind of a sooty flame, uh, some of that soot is hot right after the reaction, the oxygen strips the hydrogens off the carbons. And, and you get the black body radiation. So it's a yellow looking light. Now, if you have a really complete combustion, you won't see the yellow. So if you get your Bunsen burner tuned just right, you only see the blue part of the flame. You don't see the yellow because you've got it tuned just right and all the carbon is getting burnt. Okay, so that's a, the, the, using this uh, enthalpy of combustion would be an ideal case. That would be a, a like a perfect burn. You would get all of those joules out of that substance but it is a good approximation. So you could look at a fuel and rank them according to their um, enthalpy of combustion, and you could, you could rank those heat generators. So that's what we do in, in PCHEM2. This is a quantitative structure activity relationship for the enthalpy of combustion. So I got into the CRC a few years ago and typed in the, um, the uh, molecular formulas, the number of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and nitrogens. And so I had a column, columns of those, and then I had their enthalpy of combustion. So I typed in that for 905 compounds, very tedious task in Excel. And then it did a linear regression. And you guys know how to do linear regressions. I just said, how does the enthalpy of combustion depend upon the number of carbon atoms? I would imagine if I have more carbon atoms, I have uh, more enthalpy, right? As that burns with oxygen. And how does it depend upon hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen? And so those are my four variables is A, B, C, and D. So you've got your molecular formula here. And I had the enthalpy of combustion and I just did a linear regression on the number and types of atoms. And this is the equation I got right here. So you can take the number of carbon atoms, put it in for A, the number of hydrogen atoms, put it in for B, etc., and add this intercept to 32.1 and you get the enthalpy of combustion. Now, how well does this model work? Well, here's my QSAR output, <clears throat> and here's the literature values. And if it's a perfect model, it had, should have a slope of one and an R squared of one. And so here's my slope, okay, it's 0.9989, and here's my R squared. So that's pretty amazing. I didn't expect it to be this good at all. In fact, I did it for like a 50 compounds because, you know, who would type in a 900 without testing it, right? So I tested it on 50 or 60 and I thought, oh man, this looks pretty good. So it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And so I got tired at 900 and then I saw five more and I wanted those. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive to go from really small molecules like methane all the way up to C70, C60. And, and then they all fall right on that line. Now, why is there so much spread down here? Well, because look at this, it's not really focused on the structure. It's just focused on the number and types of atoms. So our uh, structural isomers give the same value in our model. So, you know, um, there might be slightly different literature values, say for uh, dimethyl ether, CH3O, CH3, and CH3, CH2OH. Right, those have the same number and types of atoms, but they'll have slightly different literature values for their enthalpy of combustion. And, and it makes sense, right? Because there's gonna be a little bit different energetic breaking two OC bonds, oxygen carbon bonds, versus breaking an OH bond and a distant oxygen carbon bond. And so that's why there's some spread in, in the data down here. But it's still a pretty remarkable model. Now, if we take this uh, enthalpy of combustion and divide it by the molar mass, we have the kilojoules per gram. 
And so that's the specific heat of combustion. Well, we've been doing a QSPR our whole chemistry lives, right? That's calculating the molar mass, right? So if I have the number of carbon atoms, I multiply that by this factor, 12.01, and the number of hydrogen atoms by one, number of nitrogen by 14, number of oxygen by 16. And if I put that in the denominator, I get kilojoules per mole on top and, and grams per mole on bottom. So the per moles all cancel and I get the specific heat. And this is why the politicians and, and some folks are saying we need to transfer to a hydrogen economy because in terms of per gram, look how much energy we get out of hydrogen. The problem is we don't buy hydrogen by the gram, we buy it by the volume and it's the least compressible gas. So it's hard to get a lot of hydrogen into a small space because it's a gas and it's the least compressible gas. Methane is uh, easier to compress. You can liquefy it, but it, you see we, we lost quite a bit of specific heat when we go to methane. All of this row right here are our hydrocarbons. So what are all of these down here? These are pretty poor fuels on a per gram basis. Yuck, right? <laughs> if I'm gonna carry around a mass of fuel in my fuel tank, I want something that's gonna give me the more joules per mass that I'm carrying. And so these down here are pretty poor fuels. And these are already oxygenated. These are alcohols ketones, uh, acids. And so why would, you know, look at this up here. We see this negative factor for the oxygen. Because what we're doing is we're reacting the fuel with oxygen to get energy. And if there's already oxygen in the fuel, it's already partially combusted. And so it doesn't make any sense to make alcohol and burn it in our cars. Hydrocarbons are way better in terms of the amount of fuel mileage you're going to get. So ethanol based fuel is actually lowering our, our fuel mileage quite a bit. Okay. There's other reasons, political reasons to use it. The, you know, the, um, a lot of folks want to turn excess crops like starch based crops like corn into ethanol and it provides another outlet for, for their products. So. <clears throat> So anyway, this is, um, this is the specific heat. Now you can take a, an estimate of the mass of, of uh, combustible material in a room, and that's what a fire inspector would do. If they come through the building, they would look at my office and they would see all those books and they would say, there's too much fire uh, loading. They call combustible loading in my office for the one sprinkler head that I have. And so they would say, you gotta get rid of some of these books. They would, they would just sort of estimate the mass of all that paper and they know how many kilojoules uh, come from a gram of paper. And so then they would say this, this uh, fire suppression system can only handle so many kilojoules of, of heat and before the fire uh, gets out of this room. So, so these are the tools of the trade. They look at that mass of fuel. They assume an adiabatic um, combustion so that there's really no heat loss while it's burning. And, and, and so then they... Um, generate an amount of gas that could push over, uh, push outdoors or push windows out. And then they, um, they calculate the uh, sort of the max moles of gas and the highest temperature. And so they come up with this stoichiometric ratio. So we have the, um, the stoichiometric equivalence here and then the actual system up here. And they calculate this term phi. So let's play around with some of these calculations. So what is the stoichiometric equivalent for methane in air? So here's our combustion reaction. So we have methane, which is a gas, that's our fuel. And we wanna see what the stoichiometric amount is. So how can we get two moles of oxygen for every mole of methane, but we're using air, right? We're not using pure oxygen. And so our stoichiometric ratio is that number of moles of fuel, which is methane, and number of moles of oxygen, which is two moles of oxygen. So that's the, the perfect ratio. So how many, um, I mean, how much methane do we have in a, in a room of, of air? So how many moles of air will provide two moles of oxygen? 
So here's our atmospheric composition. And you see that oxygen's around 20, 21% mole percent in, in air. Okay, we also have argon, we have nitrogen. So, so two moles of oxygen and one mole of air contains 0 0.209 moles of oxygen. So we need 9.57 moles of air. Now these stoichiometric ratios are masses. And so what is the mass of this air? So to calculate the molar mass of air, one mole of air contains 0 0.781 uh, moles of nitrogen, 0 0.209 moles of oxygen. Uh, point, it's really 1% or 0 0.009 uh, moles of argon. And then we stop there. We're down, you know, we're down in the fourth decimal place for CO2, so we're really not interested in CO2. But the top three are nitrogen, ar oxygen, and argon. So we end up with this molar mass of air. What is it close to? We look at our three molar masses here. We've got argon, oxygen, nitrogen, right? Yeah, because nitrogen is the most abundant thing. So you're, it makes sense that the molar mass of air should be close to nitrogen. It's 28.9 grams of, of air per mole. Okay, and so if we want uh, that many moles of air, then how many grams do we have? So 277 grams of air. So our molar mass of methane, for every mole of methane, we have 16 grams of methane. And to get two moles of oxygen, we need 277 grams of air. So this is the stoichiometric equivalence in terms of masses. If we do that division, the, the grams cancel, okay? And you could look at it as a percent. So it looks about like 5.8% by mass of methane. And so they'll come in with vapor, you know, uh, measuring devices. Someone says, oh, I've got a gas leak. And they call the fire department. They have a little uh, gas vapor measuring device that measures in percent fuel. And so it'll sniff the air to see if it's safe to go in. And so they'll send the person in with a little hose and they'll sniff the air and it says, uh, you know, 5.6% fuel, you know, methane or what have you. And the guy slowly backs up because <laughs> it's right at that stoichiometric amount. So that's an explosive atmosphere. The methane and the oxygen are just primed and all it would take is an activation energy, a spark and boom, it goes. Now, one time I had, we had a hot water heater replaced uh, as a natural gas hot water heater, and the guy bled the lines to, you know, get all the air out before he hooked it up, and he's running it into the house, and I said, you know, what are you, what are you waiting on? You know, you waiting until you smell it? And he said, no, I'm waiting until you smell it. Well, I could really smell it. And I was like, well, I can smell it. You didn't ask me, you know, so he shut it off. And then I was all nervous because it was a super strong smell of natural gas, which is fake. Actually, they put in um, they put in an odor chemical, the natural gas you can't smell. And I was getting all nervous. And he goes, no, no, no. He said it, it stinks bad enough to kind of drive you out of the house before it gets to 5%. But the problem is you won't smell it if you're asleep. And so for some reason, we, we think, oh, I'll smell it and I'll wake up. But no, you, you, apparently your nose, your sense of smell sort of shuts down or your brain doesn't pay attention to it when you're asleep. And so people die of smoke inhalation. They die of, um, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, smelly things. You would think that would have woken them up, but it didn't. So let's think about a house. So would a five liter per minute gas leak reach an explosive concentration overnight? So now this is... Um, detail for you guys. I'm going to go through it fairly quickly so we can get to the explosive stuff, but you have the video. Okay. So you can go back through. So can you do this as a chemist? You better be able to, because it's just unit conversions. Okay. So this is where you get to just think your way through a problem. So what is a five liter per minute gas leak? How much methane does that deliver? over eight hours. So start with the thing you know, eight hours, and then start converting the units until you get to methane. What mass of methane would this be, right? 
And so we can go from hours to, to minutes, right? So that's 60 minutes in an hour. We know the gas leak delivers five liters in a minute. And so that's five liters of natural gas per minute. Then we know that if it's STP or as ambient temperature, so uh, if you take in 298 Kelvin, um, uh, one mole of methane at one atmosphere pressure, the volume is 24.4. So we got that from the ideal gas law. So that's the number of moles of methane. There's uh, 16 grams of methane per mole. Um, we want to probably go to kilograms. And so that's 1.5 kilograms of methane in eight hours at a five liter per minute leak. Now, what about the mass of oxygen? So let's go ahead and think about the size of the, of the, the room or the house. So let's just take a 2,000 square foot house, eight feet tall ceilings, okay? Again, it's, there's, this is one way to do the problem. There's, you know, maybe you estimate a 3,000 square foot house. Then you have 28.3 liters per cubic foot. You have the same uh, conversion of liters to moles of air. And then we have our molar mass of air and then convert to kilograms. And so we've had 536 kilograms of air. So what's our actual system? Our system is 0 0.00293 kilograms of methane per kilogram of air. So we could calculate phi, that system goes on top. Okay, the stoichiometric amount goes on bottom. And for an explosive atmosphere, phi would be one, they would match, okay? And so this is about 5% of what we need to have an explosive atmosphere. And so we're safe in this case. It doesn't seem, I mean, that seems crazy, five liters per minute, uh, but that's not really anywhere near the, the stoichiometric amount. It's about 5% of what we would need in terms of the stoichiometric amount. Okay, so we call that too lean. It's not enough fuel, okay. And so let's, let's look at, again, you've got the video, so you can come back through this. <clears throat> when that phi is one, you have an explosive atmosphere. But what about the limits? Well, below which, um, you're below the lower explosivity limit, the LEL. So that's the lower explosivity limit. And what is this one? The UEL, that's the upper EL. If you're above that, you're too rich. So you could be too rich, right? You've got a room that's so full of methane, there's not enough oxygen. That's kind of like the backdraft situation. It's not enough oxygen. Um, and so it's not an explosive risk um, unless you introduce oxygen, <laughs> okay? Somewhere between the, the really rich fuel area and the regular atmosphere, you're gonna have an explosive concentration because you can't get out of a really rich environment and go to a really lean environment without passing through the explosivity limit. And so it's a really dangerous situation to be too rich, but it's not technically explosive, but somewhere between that region and, and air, it is explosive. Okay. And then this is just showing that some gases go to the ceiling like methane, other gases go to the floor like a spilled fuel or or cans that are fuel cans that are open, um, that fuel can drift along the floor and maybe hit a pilot light and a heater, and it can flash back and then blow up. Now let's talk about putting oxygen in the very molecules. So this is when we get into explosives. This is the oxygen balance calculation. Notice this is not your normal combustion equation. Where's the oxygen, right? No. O2. So in calculating an explosive uh, oxygen balance, there's no O2 on the left. So this doesn't use the QSPR equation. This is just looking at with this molecule, if I rearrange the oxygens, hydrogens, and carbons, because a shock wave has come through the material, broken all the covalent bonds, and now they all get to pick their favorites, the oxygen's gonna go to carbon first, okay? It's gonna go to 
water second, or maybe, I don't know which one, first or second, but it's going to prefer the carbon, going to prefer the hydrogen. So oxygen is going to be consumed by these two. The nitrogen likes itself because it makes that triple bond. So we're going to make N2. And then whatever is left over will be either a, a negative number, which means we're oxygen deficient, or a positive number, which means we have excess oxygen. Okay. And so let's look at nitroglycerin. So here's nitroglycerin, three carbon molecule. It's got uh, nitro groups on it, so uh, NO3 molecules. And so we can just take those. Uh, so we have the number, this A, the number of oxygens. It's going to go onto the carbon. So we have, uh, let's see, no, 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 number of the carbons. Okay, so we have the three carbons. So we have three CO2s. So we have the hydrogens here. So there's five of those. They come in pairs to make water. So we'll have five halves of water molecule, so five halves of a mole of water. Okay. And then the number of nitrogens, C divided by two. So since N2 comes as a, as, as a diatomic molecule, we have three halves of a mole of N2. And then we add up all of the, the, the oxygen on the left and the right, and then that's what goes into this little slot here. So on the left, we have nine oxygens. On the right, we have six moles of oxygen taken up by the CO2, two and a half moles used for the water, okay? So you add that together, that's six, seven, eight and a half, okay? Okay, eight and a half um, compared to nine gives us, again, a quarter mole of O2. So that's why it's not a half a mole of oxygen, it's a quarter mole of O2. But that's a positive number. Okay, so we have excess oxygen. So we take that amount of moles of uh, that excess oxygen times the molar mass of oxygen and divide it by the molar mass of the compound, and that's a, that's a percent by mass. And so we have a positive 4% of oxygen in nitroglycerin. And that's why nitroglycerin, in, in my opinion, is just so shock sensitive. It's ready to react. And all you do is just tap it with a with the um, with a hammer and you get an explosion in the 19th century provided the turning point in the story of explosions has had to come here to the defense academy of the uk because we're going to make what they first discovered in 1846 an italian chemist a samuel sobrero Notice the ice bath. <laughs> All right, whenever you're nitrating an organic, the, there's an activation energy for getting the, the nitro, first nitrate to go on. And then the second one's easier and the third one's easier. So it, it's a big hump at the first and then it's downhill. And, and each one of those nitrations is exothermic. Okay, so it helps with the second, it helps with the third because it's giving off heat. So you have to really control the temperature. It's a very dangerous synthesis, which is to our advantage forensically because we don't want people making this at home. It's a very dangerous synthesis and people can blow themselves up very easily. So they go through the synthesis a little bit. They don't really tell you too many details. But then we get to this little drop of uh, nitroglycerin and they put a bit on this steel plate. Okay. Let's go right here. So look up there, slow down 260 times, slow down 330 times. See how that's a detonation? It's over. So that's a detonation. The, the shock wave is going through the material and it's reacting instantly. Okay, so let's go back here and look at gun cotton. This is a deflagration. So this is burning at slower than the speed of sound. What's up guys, welcome back. Today is an exciting day because today is the day we get to test out our nitro cotton. Now, in yesterday's video, we took some extremely dangerous acids and used them to turn ordinary cotton balls into nitro cotton. What exactly is that? Can't really tell the difference. Well, so, 
this is still used in our artillery shells. They have these little little cotton pillows that they put in there, and it's nitro cotton or nitrocellulose. And depending upon how far and how fast they want the shell to go, they'll put two, three, four little pillows of cotton in, and they'll they'll put the shell in, and then they'll light off the nitro. And it again, it uh, the nitrocellulose gives a very predictable pressure, and it pushes that shell out. Okay, so. He burns um, regular cotton first. There you go. Oh, black cotton first. Oh. Black paper. Okay, here's the burning cotton. So this is, yeah, that's regular cotton burning. Let's start off burning one regular cotton ball just so we have a standard to measure it against. And I like this thing often because this is a flame from a barbecue igniter, but that's really. Oh, cheap. come on. Just go. <laughs> <laughs> See how slowly it burns? Because the oxygen has to get to the fuel. And so it's not well mixed. The ball turns black. Okay. And here we go. Yesterday, so theoretically, it should be the most volatile. Really. Boom, there it goes. But and really slow compared to the nitroglycerin. You see that? It just, it was whoosh, and it was gone, but it was very predictable, very controlled. You put that in a partially contained tube, and it can push things. So what's the evidence for making nitro cotton? Well, you're going to have the sulfuric acid, the nitric acid, cellulose, and things like that. So um, the point, I guess, is to, to think about what, what evidence would be be left behind. <clears throat> so let's go do a top hat real quick to capture the attendance today. Okay, so if you had to quickly estimate the molar mass of air, which gas would you use as an estimate? All right, I'll put a timer on so we knock this out quickly. Very good, moving along. All right, thank you for moving quick. All right, so good, I see lots of folks using nitrogen and air is mostly nitrogen. So it's gonna be close to 28. We calculate that it would have 20% of the 32 grams per mole, so that'd be 28.9. So that's good. Okay, one more. An explosion can happen. Now you have to think on this one. Pick your favorite answer. An explosion can happen when the fuel and oxygen are well mixed and near the stoichiometric amount. An organic molecule contains enough oxygen to turn the carbons and hydrogens into water and CO2. A powdered explosive gets wet with water or solid fuel is burned in air. more. Okay. Better hurry. All right, good job. <laughs> right in under the wire. Okay, so we've got uh, 14 and 6 for the top two, and those are both correct. Okay, so <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, which one do I do? I know. Um, the, the solid fuel burning air would be like the cotton situation. So the air has a hard time getting to the to the solid and decomposing it. And that's interesting. Nobody picked C. Um, C is actually how you stabilize an explosive. So if you have an explosive and you have it in powdered form, uh, we store it wet typically. Store it in water so that it can't build up hot spots and can't even start with that activation energy. Water is a great way to keep the temperature of anything down. And so storing explosives wet with water uh, is a safe way to store them.
So let's talk about um, this decomposition. So it takes energy to decompose solid fuels, um, even and liquid fuels too, um, or to evaporate the liquid fuels. And so in this case, think about a candle. You know, if that wax was flammable, it would be a very dangerous thing because you light it and then the whole thing would burst into flames. Think about that cotton ball. It was burning in all directions. And what if a candle did that? You wouldn't want that in your bathroom, you know? So we have this tiny little wick that melts the wax and draws it up the wick. And then as it approaches the hot area, it starts to decompose. So those really long hydrocarbons are not volatile. They're not gonna evaporate, but they are gonna melt. And they get drawn up the wick where they start to decompose. You know, you get to organic molecules around 350 C, they start to break apart. What are, what's happening? You know, from the from PKM1, the vibrational modes get excited. And so think about this long molecule of CH2s, right? You start to really stretch those and then small pieces start to break off. So like a methane will break off or a ethane will break off. And then you have a reactive species. The carbon's actually missing a bond. And so it's ready to react with, with oxygen. And so then it goes into the flame area, starts reacting and getting ripped apart by oxygen. <clears throat> but we're using a lot of that heat from that flame to melt the wax. And so we're melting that wax, um, drawing it up the wick. So we're using this melting. And so that's, that's keeping that candle wax at, at a constant melting temperature. So that's another thing that makes candles pretty safe. You'd have to melt all of this um, candle down, make it completely liquid before say the glass over here um, started to heat up. But that's why they say don't ever leave a candle unintended because you will eventually melt all that wax depending on the size of the flame. And then the glass starts to heat up and then it might heat what it's sitting on. And, and so then you have, if you have a liquid fuel, uh, you have to vaporize that fuel if it's if it's vaporizable, like the, the candle wax really is just going to decompose. But if it's like a gasoline, if somebody pours gasoline on the carpet and lights it, you have to evaporate the gasoline before it'll burn. And that gasoline will hold that carpet at the boiling point of the gasoline. And that's not going to be the decomposition temperature of the fibers. So what we actually see for evidence of like a, of someone who dumped fuel on their carpet to set their house on fire is this protected piece in the middle here. So that was protected by the gasoline. And this is called a donut pattern. You see the, the heat right here did decompose this part of the carpet, but the center of that was protected by the evaporating fuel. Then you also have fuel that's soaked into the carpet here, which never got hot enough to burn. And so there's your chemical evidence. You get in there and get a hold of those uh, bits of carpet. And you, you take a control sample out here. You take a couple of evidence samples here and here, put them all in uh, arson cans, and then you can analyze them uh, for gasoline or some sort of flammable substance. That Decomposition is called pyrolysis. So using heat to break things, lysis is breaking, pyrolysis. Um, and then there's not enough oxygen, so it's anoxic decomposition. So you have that char layer. So when you're looking at the evidence, there's also chemical evidence here. What was the fuel? What was the, you know, you take a control sample from the carpet, like normal wood or carpet fibers, then you have the pyrolysis zone and then the charred layer. We'll get into these patterns uh, in the next part of the course. So we'll come back and look at, at arson. Uh, this link down here, the stupid arson tricks, that's mixing um, like pyrogolic substances like brake fluid and chlorine tablets from the pool um, to create a, a delayed reaction that will start a fire later. And people tried that to create, to um, commit arson and they were caught because, you know, why do you have uh, chlorine contamination and and brake fluid contamination, say in a coffee pot, you know, so they'll set the timer and go on vacation and then it pours the brake fluid on the, on the chlorine, 
creates a, a fire in the kitchen and then the house burns down. So this, uh, we talked about this DDT, the deflagration to detonation transition. <clears throat> and it's really based on controlling that pressure. And then if we take a propellant, we confine it, okay, we might be able to create what's called a low explosive. Uh, typically these are very sensitive. And sensitive means different things, right? It, it's how does that that um, detonation, how is it initiated? So some of these are initiated by friction. With friction, you get a mixing effect, you get an activation energy, and that's what we're using for our matches. Okay, so you think about the matches, we have uh, some phosphorus on the side of the box and we have something that will react with phosphorus. Typically, it's two different types of phosphorus. You scrape off the wax coating on the match head and mix the phosphorus amount and it will it will start to react spontaneously generate enough heat to catch the wood on fire okay so that would be friction initiated some things are heat initiated other things are shock and so this is the one thing i want to point out to you when we say shock we mean mechanical shock not electrical shock And we test that with a thing called the drop hammer test. So just like that guy hit that nitroglycerin with a hammer, we make a, a test where we have a one kilogram mass on a rail like this. Put a little eye hook on the top, have a rope and a pulley. <laughs> okay. And then we put the explosive down here, explosive powder. And just so to make sure it goes off, you know, like the worst case scenario, we have sandpaper on bottom. Sandpaper, explosive. And a microphone. So we can listen. So we go in the other room, <laughs> let go of the string, hammer drops down, do we hear a pop or not? Okay, so we do a test, we drop it with no explosive, we hear what a hammer sounds like when it hits, boom, you know. Then we pull it up three feet, okay, let go, boom, okay, it didn't go off. We may have damaged the explosive, so we take that sandpaper sample off, put another one, put some explosive on, go up 10 feet, bang, okay. So somewhere between three feet and 10 feet is the threshold for that explosive. And so that, that would be pretty sensitive, you know, between three and 10 feet. That's not a very hard force, one kilogram mass dropping eight feet. Uh, but uh, our insensitive explosives, so a lot of times our high explosives, we want those to be insensitive. You know, they can be 60, 70, 80 feet high. Now they'll increase the mass for those tests instead of trying to make an 80 foot high test sand okay but uh but you know some of the insensitive explosives we have have like over 70 feet for their drop hammer test so you could just hit that thing with a hammer and it wouldn't go off why is that important well that's in the back of my jeep and someone's shooting at me <laughs> what if they shoot that artillery shell okay with a 50 caliber round i don't want to blow up and so insensitive explosives are really important for safety. Okay, maybe we're not in a war zone. Maybe we're driving down the interstate with a load of weapons to take to the Air Force or the, 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 you know, the Army base. And there's a collision. Okay, then now we're talking about public safety. We don't want shock-sensitive explosives driving down our highways. Okay, <laughs> so it's very important. And so this is, uh, but then how do we get those shock-insensitive explosives to actually blow up well that we call this the explosive train so we start out with the detonators <clears throat> you can have different types of detonators and again chemical evidence right if you have a, a blasting cap or what have you you will look at the chemistry of these things you'll pull the pyrotechnic mix out and see if that's a homemade thing 
if it's military sourced or what have you. So, you know, different kind of manufacturers use different kinds of explosives in these uh, these blasting caps. Some of these are typically used for mining. And so that would be a source for someone to steal blasting caps from a mining operation, or they might be military sourced, or they might be hobby sourced. And so this little electric fuse here, you can get those at Hobby Lobby, okay, for Estes rockets, okay? They don't have the, the pyrotechnic mix. They're not in a blasting cap, but this is an electric match. You put a little low voltage, nine volt battery on there, and boom, you've got something that catches on fire in a predictable way, okay? But you don't have the pyrotechnic mix. So you might see some homemade stuff and you say, okay, this person has a whole bunch of uh, electric matches, but I don't see any other rocket parts around here. So he's not shooting off Estes rockets. What's he trying to make? So those are the kinds of things that you might be analyzing. And then you have these um, uh, exploding bridge wire or, or slapper type. Um, these are the high end stuff. This is the Neiman Marcus of blasting caps. I don't know, you don't have Neiman Marcus anymore, do you? Um, high dollar, how about that? Very precise detonation properties for these uh, bottom two. Once again, whatever initiation, whether it's spark or heat, starts to build up that um, that shock wave and it runs through the material and then you have a detonation building. So these blasting caps are meant to go from deflagration to detonation in a predictable way. So coming out of the blasting cap is a detonation wave. Not really much to do anything. It'll take your hand off, but it's not going to take down a building or, or a, you know, whatever you're trying to blow up. So these are the primaries and low explosives. So these are the things that would be used in primers for ammunition or in um, blasting caps and so on, or a low explosive like nitrocellulose. So this is PETN for, for detonators, very um, preferred for detonators. But like lead stiffnate, for ammunition, for ammo, okay. So that would be an ammo primer. They might mix some nitroglycerin in. Uh, they might use lead azide. So here we have lead. Here we have lead, two major components of, uh, or lead's a major component of um, gunshot residue. And then also some of the um, antimony and, and uh, and uh, barium, and so then we also have mercury fulminate, which is less, you know, less common. So these are those initiators. Then you have the main charges. So these are the high explosives. These are the ones that give the most energy, and these would be your main charge explosives. And TATB is the least ex the least sensitive. It is the, probably the safest on this list. Um, HMX and RDX are uh, give more energy. But they're a little more sensitive. Here's TNT, you've heard of trinitrotoluene. <clears throat> and so one of the things that I'd like for you to do chemically is just to be able to identify, these are nitros, nitro aromatics. So you see the nitro aromatic classification here. So all three of these are nitro aromatics. This one is extremely dangerous, picric acid. And occasionally universities discover this in the biochemistry lab. Apparently it's some reagent in biochemistry. And so they'll buy it for a particular analysis. And the problem is 
you know, Aldrich and all of them, they sell you way too much. You might need a few milligrams or maybe even at most a gram, but you buy it in a 50 gram bottle or even a hundred gram bottle or even ridiculous a 500 gram bottle. You're never going to use 500 grams of this stuff, but it's underwater. So it's safe. It sits on the shelf for 10 years. The water evaporates out from under the lid. And now you have a friction sensitive explosive sitting on a shelf in an academic lab. So if you're ever in an academic lab and you see picric acid on the shelf, leave it alone. <laughs> Look and see if you see that there's no water in there, call the university police and say we have an explosive problem and talk to your professor too. But you talk to me, I'm going to be calling the police and getting the bomb squad in here to take that out to the woods <laughs> and shoot it with a rifle or something to get rid of it because it's that dangerous. The thing that you naturally want to do is open the lid, but that's the thing that will blow up in your face because of friction sensitivity. So as the water leaves, it's a fairly volatile compound. It starts to crystallize under the lid and then you turn it and boom. Okay. Yeah. So that's no, no good. They found one in West Texas A&M. They did that exactly that. They took it out into the pasture and shot it with a 30-06 and it, it left a pretty big crater. <laughs> so, um, good old boys. That's great. So then you have the nitramines. So then you have a, a nitro group stuck to an, another nitrogen. So notice these are different. These are not nitro aromatics. This one's both. So tetral is both. It has nitro aromatics on the bottom but then it has a nitramine on top. Now nitramine gives you a little bit more energy. So it gives you a little more energy than say trinitrotoluene. So you'll see like comp B will have some tetral in it. <clears throat> it might have some HMX. There's a lot of different formulations of plastic explosives. So they'll synthesize the explosive and then they'll have it in organic solvent. And then they'll mix it in with uh, the, either that or they'll make like say a, a slurry Oh, in water where they have the powder and they'll slurry and stir it up with the, with the, with water. And then they'll have the polymer in an organic solvent and they'll start to blend that into this aqueous solution. Well, that polymer is not soluble in water. So what does it do? It gets all stuck on the explosive powder and coats it. And so then you have these little um, polymer coated explosive powders and and then you pull off the water, you filter it, you dry it, and then you have this little plastic beads that are actually plastic explosives, and then you press those together and make your charges. So, so that, that whole um, area of plastic explosives, it's mostly explosive. All you need to hold these together is like 5% by mass of polymer. So a lot of these plastic uh, explosives are like 90, 95% explosive and just a little bit of, of polymer. But guess what? That polymer is key to knowing where it came from, who made it, and so on, because you're going to have different molecular weight properties and so on in that polymer. So analyzing the polymer with, say, gel permeation chromatography would tell you a lot about where that plastic explosive was made. Now let's go back to that idea of the explosive train. We had that detonation, or the detonator, which turns burning into detonation. And then we have this main charge, which is a huge amount of explosive. Think of an artillery shell. And you want it to be safe, so you make an insensitive explosive and fill it with an insensitive explosive. So you got this little detonator with a pretty weak explosive, a low explosive, and you need to then boost that shock wave up to get the main charge to go off. Because the main charge is not very um, sensitive. You know, it needs a really big thump. So you almost need an explosive to set off the main charge explosive. And that's what this booster is. So here we would have three different, chemically, we would have three different types of explosives. We'd have a sensitive detonator explosive, a mid-range booster explosive that might be a little sensitive. We wouldn't want to make the whole charge out of that. And then we have an insensitive main charge. And so just not, not paying attention to the right side of this figure, just focusing on the left, this is what we mean by an explosive train. The power goes up as you go along. So you start with some tiny little environmental signal like a spark or an electrical pulse or friction uh, or heat and or even acid-base reaction that generates heat. And then that turns into a deflagration, which then turns into a detonation. Then that shock wave goes into the booster. The booster ramps that up 
and then that shockwave goes into the main charge and sets it off. Now, the reason I put evidence here, if we don't have a nuclear event, if we just have a, an explosive detonation, so the terrorist sets off an explosive, um, and it's a sophisticated one, this would be a very sophisticated explosive, it's hard for that shock wave to turn this corner and burn that material that I've circled in red. So there's going to be un, unexploded ordnance all around the scene, and that's your evidence. So in any conventional explosive, and by conventional I mean non-nuclear, there's going to be explosive residue. <clears throat> if you can map the pattern of that explosive residue, then you, you, you may know which side the detonator was on, right? Because this is going to get blown back. And, and some, of this, some of this brass, if it's a brass collar around that, that detonator may get blown back. So you might actually find residue. And then what sets off the detonator? Maybe the, the arming, fusing, and firing. We call it the fire set. How did, this, how did the signal get to the detonator? that's going to get blown back. And so years ago with the, with the uh, Boston Marathon bombing, you could look at the video of that bombing and you could see the, the explosion went up quite a bit and you could see the brick on the building behind where the explosion took, took place. You could just see the shock wave uh, pulverize the face of the brick um, as it went up. And so obviously something released and went up. And so I, and not that anybody knows because nobody asked me, but I accurately predicted in one of my little blogs where to find the arming, fusing, and firing on the top of a building. And sure enough, like two buildings over, they found the lid of the pressure cooker and inside the lid was the circuit board that was used to detonate it. And so they could find information, evidence um, from that arming, fusing, and firing. So your evidence is going to fly away in that direction, as I show. Um, now, if it's a nuclear event, it's a non-conventional explosive, uh, and if it's a, a substantial yield, you're not going to find anything. I mean, that is going to be vaporized. There's not going to be any metal left over from the detonator. The arming, fusing, and firing is vaporized. It vaporizes everything around it. There's so much energy in the nuclear part. So a fission reaction, like uranium-235, uh, once it's once it's pressed together, these subcritical masses are pressed close enough, then the neutrons don't escape the material. They actually hit other nuclei. And so this is not spontaneous fission, like happens with just natural radioactivity. It's called stimulated fission. So the neutrons hit other nuclei and make them unstable. So it's about neutron control. You get uh, subcritical masses, the neutrons are escaping the material you get to a critical mass, the neutrons have a higher probability of hitting a nucleus before they get out. And so if they're hitting other nuclei and they're causing those nuclei to be unstable, they break apart and they give you more neutrons. So you have a multiplication of neutrons. And that's what makes it critical or supercritical. So when you get more neutrons and they hit more nuclei, it runs away. And that's when you have a fission uh, reaction, st stimulated fission. Now, if you put in this high pressure area something that can fuse, like, like uh, tritium, you can have tritium uh, get compressed such that the nuclei touch. And if they touch, they can form a helium atom. And they can also give off neutrons. And that gives off an enormous amount of energy, you know, 10 to 100 times more energy per nucleon. So, um, so that would be, a, this would be called a boosted weapon where you have the subcritical masses coming and then they cause a fusion reaction. So this is as, as big as it gets right here is going, that explosive train going up to actually causing the fissions, uh, stimulated fission or even fusion reactions. I pray you never run across any of these things, okay? But the evidence for conventional explosion, you may run across, okay? Now, there's one other thing that, that they mix into conventional explosives. Uh, we looked at organic explosives, and all of those 
enthalpies of reaction are in the you know in the the low hundreds range, okay, uh, per mole. If you were to add in say aluminum powder or zinc powder, then you're getting into the high hundreds, 700 kilojoules per mole instead of 300 kilojoules per mole, and not that much more mass. And so a lot of times they'll mix in powder and call it blast enhanced explosives. So Cybex is shock insensitive, blast enhanced explosives. Now you might hear the term thermobaric, or this is from my morning news feed this morning. It says vacuum bombs. So what in the world is a vacuum bomb? Well, it's one of these blast enhanced bombs that cause an in initial shock wave. So this is the initial high explosive and then they light off the blast enhanced, the metal powder, and then you get this really slow growing and falling overpressure. And that's, that's actually better for knocking things over. It's sustained pressure. A, a really thin, high pressure shock wave is not going to really knock stuff over. And so I've got this video here to show you what a blast enhanced explosive will do to a house. Okay, so the, the, the bomb has detonated. Notice it didn't hit the house. It's over here. This is a test video just to see its effectiveness. Okay, so the, the bomb has blown up here. That's that initial sharp pop, okay? And what is all of this? That's metal powder. So it spreads out metal powder. Why is it spreading the metal powder out? Oxygen in the air. Okay, so it's using the oxygen in the air. So it disperses the metal powder and then it has a second charge. So just like your fireworks, the mortars, right? They have a charge that's a propellant charge, and then they have a second charge in the air that blows up. This is, this is made the same way. It has an initial dispersal charge, and then it has a firing charge that lights off the metal. So watch now, here it goes. So there's the lighting, off. well, it didn't light it. Okay, here it comes. Then it lights off the metal and the metal burns. And then you can see how slow that shock wave was. It rolled past the house. Now these are boards right here coming off the house. So on this back side of the house, it hit it with enough pressure to just launch the wood off the back side of the house. Um, much more devastating than just a simple high explosive. Now look, at, you see this house go right, left, right? Okay, so that, that left movement is the, is the sucking movement. So it's like a splash. You do a cannonball in the water, you push the water out, and then there's a vacuum that comes back, and that's that splash. So it creates a splash vacuum too. So when they're talking about vacuum bombs, it's nothing new. It's not like a new technology. It's a thermobaric bomb, which have been around for quite a while. You get that huge overpressure, but then you get this splash back. And so that's what they're using in Ukraine right now. So they're, they're talking about it being uh, used specifically because it's um, uh, bad on people. This vacuum, well, the overpressure obviously will, if you're, if you're close, um, will destroy a human body. But then the splash vacuum can affect people in a larger radius. And, and you can see the devastation by looking at some of the pictures from the streets. So, so that's going on right now. Um, evidence, what would the evidence be? Well, if you had unburned metallic powder, you would know that that was the kind of weapon that was used, okay? Knowing what kind of metal it was being used might, might lead to a source of that particular weapon, trace elements in the metal powder. If you had somebody that was actually trying to build one of these and they had metal powder in their garage, you know, why do you have that? Why do you have these kinds of things? And so metal powder can be a problem, you know, evidence-wise, and so now you know. All right, so that's, that's all for today. Have a great spring break. Be safe. Enjoy the...